I owe Joe an apology. We talked last week about him reading at 1030, and I forgot to send him the email reminding him about it. <laughs> so um, that, that surprise and shift, thank you for your, your uh, willingness to hop up um, and share in that. Uh, today we get to wrap up our stewardship series together as we've been reflecting on how we've been, how over the last year we have shared in order to love our neighbors and to love God, as well as today, we're looking at how we share to love into future generations. We may or may not have been heavy-handed in planning it to coincide with third grade Bible presentation, but I figure you're good with that. We like the excitement. <laughs> let, us, let us start with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this day for this time to share in, in your presence, to share in community and connection with each other, the gift of music and prayer and, and these stories in scriptures that ground us. Lord, we pray as we reflect on this passage from the book of Deuteronomy that you would open our eyes to see our hearts to be transformed and our ears to hear. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As I said, the last several weeks, we've been reflecting on how we, we share in the work of loving God and loving our neighbor, and, and today we turn our attention to the work of loving into the future, having a vision that goes beyond our witness today and tomorrow and in, into the next decade and century even. And there wasn't a better scripture to sit with, a better place to stop in, in scripture than this passage from Deuteronomy. Now, it comes with some really, really neat and important context. The first thing we have to notice is that this is from, from the part of, of the Bible for us that is, is the Hebrew scriptures. It's the Jewish text. It's, it's a text that, that comes to us from a different faith, the faith that Jesus grew up with and lived into, that Jesus was faithfully a part of the community and the connection that was there. It also comes with some assumptions to it that, that as we learn and read and study scripture, we can have those dispelled. And some of them are kind of neat. They help us to understand what's happening more and more and ground us even better in these stories. You know, as a child, I grew up loving to read the book of Genesis and Exodus because the stories were exciting and fun things, and usually by the time you got to things like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, I wanted to ignore it because they're boring and that is about it, right? If you've ever tried to read through Numbers, there's a lot of numbers in it. <laughs> there, there are some good gems of stories, but there's lots of accounting of boring things that, that may not interest us. The first half of Exodus was a delight, and then when you get to the second half, it's full of nothing but very specific instructions on how to build the tabernacle. I, I don't know anybody that delights in reading that. Uh, maybe some architects and some construction-minded folks just out of curiosity, but it was always a... Sp <laughs> Dave likes them. There we go. Um, <laughs> You know, it, digging through scripture, there's always gems that pop out. One thing that I, I grew up assuming was that those stories were written down in a similar time frame. I grew up hearing the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch as they're called, also known as the five books of Moses. I grew up as a child looking at my, at, at my Bible, assuming that, well, surely that meant that Moses wrote them, Right. Uh, it's the same sort of assumption we make with the Gospels. Surely it was the disciples that wrote them down. Mark was the author of Mark, and that's not exactly true. The funniest reality check for, for learning that the books of Moses were not written by Moses for me was a, uh, a teacher that pointed out it'd be really funny for Moses to have written that because it included what happened after Moses died. Uh, it, the, be pretty hard to write that story, right? At least in, in my understanding of how that works. Y'all may have seen something I haven't. But as we sit with this, this passage that, that is, is a centering point for the Jewish faith, it's known as the Shema, which in biblical Hebrew is just to hear. Hear, O Israel, Shema, hear. As we sit with this passage, the context is important. 
See, these, these texts weren't written down as, as they unfolded. They were written down much later, and that, that framework helps us to understand the significance of that instruction to, to recite these words to your children. Because if we want to talk about what it means to, to share the, the love of God into the future that inspires us to love our neighbor, to love God, to love one another, and that context can help us understand why they emphasize recite those words. If, you, if you've recently read the book of Daniel or looked at it or you remember some of the stories in the book of Daniel, it's set during a time when the, the, the Hebrew people are taken into captivity into Babylon. It's the Babylonian exile is what it's known as. And while they're there in exile, they have to adapt to the realities of being in a different culture, in a different world, kind of the reality of assimilating when you immigrate somewhere, just the, the small ways that your own understanding of navigating the world may change. Well, they were in that place for, for quite some time. In these stories, these books of Moses were written down as they were making their way out of exile and heading back to a home the place they had been taken from that was in shambles. It had been destroyed and was in need of, of some serious TLC, time, love, and care. That context is important because these instructions are the work of a people trying to relearn their place in the world. It's about grounding their community in foundational stories that remind them of who they are in the midst of the messiness of the world. Those are stories meant to help them know where they came from, stories meant to help ground them in moments where they feel uncertain of what it is that they're endeavoring to do as they seek to rebuild the place they had once lived at. But it is also, there are also stories that help offer them a vision for the future. Imagine being, being a people held in captivity, kept from, from your home for years, for decades, only to return knowing that you've got a lot of work in front of you to build it back up, to fix what's been shattered. That sense of community and connection that once had been there, that sense of identity of who you are being stripped away. That grounding is important. Those stories and that instruction are important. Can you imagine being that community in exile and then getting the gift of the story of the Exodus? Hey, we've been here before. We've been a people who were held in captivity and set free by the work of God. And things turned out okay. Talk about a comfort of a story. See, that, that work and that significance of foundational stories is similar to what we do each and every week in, in the church as we sit with the stories of Jesus, as we ground ourselves in those stories of Jesus that unfold a narrative of love and redemption in the midst of the messiness of the world. Those stories that remind us of the wonder that is, is God coming to dwell among us and know our joys and our happiness, the excitement of our days, but also the sorrows and the struggles of our grief. Think about the difference of the moments. Now, I, I admittedly don't have any evidence of Jesus telling jokes in the Gospels, uh, but I'm a firm believer that I think Jesus probably had a good sense of humor. It'd be hard to do what he did without it. Think about the highs of the moments where Jesus is going around healing people and then the low of, of standing at the tomb of Lazarus weeping. To sit with those foundational stories of, of Jesus or to, to ground us, to remember that, that in Christ we encounter the one that echoes over each of us, the people we love, the people we don't like so much, that they are beloved, that you are beloved by God. So when we remember that, that a key part of this passage is the instruction to recite those words to your children, we sit remembering the power that stories have to ground us, to shape us, to form us, whether they're good or bad. 
we can be framed by the love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness of God. Or we can be framed by the judgment and cruelty and malice that takes place around us so often. The thing about children, though, is that they soak up the, the things that we teach them and show them and offer to them, whether they're good or bad, right? I, I'm sure all of us in this room have, have some story that you can think of, some moment of interaction with, with a teacher or a, a family member where, where your life was impacted, your perspective was changed, you learned something you did not expect to learn, and it caused you to re- Renavigate how you were operating in the world. My favorite one to tell on myself was being in seminary, and then the worship professor I had asked the question, how many of you actually mention the Holy Spirit in the midst of worship? And I, I went through the, the brain of my, the, the memories of my childhood, rolling through the, the script on my brain, thinking through how, how, do, I, how do I present the Trinity the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, in the midst of worship, and I realized I don't ever mention the Holy Spirit. And since that day, I haven't been able to avoid mentioning the Holy Spirit. But children in particular soak up the, the lessons that we teach them. Now, I made Wendell a promise early on that I wasn't going to use my children as an example often, and I've stuck to that. Uh, today's an, ex- uh, an exemption. I'm going to use uh, a story about my oldest child, Henry. And it's predominantly because it, it's just beautiful and cute and cracks me up to think about that day. See, while we were in Valonia, Krista and I didn't have automated, automatic draft set up for our, our giving at the church. Um, Krista picked up really quickly that if she sent the check with me to put in the offering plate, odds were it was going to end up in my back pocket until Monday when I went into the office because I forget to put it in the plate. Uh, Because other things happen for pastors during worship. We tend to forget things. Surprise. But when when Krista figured that out, uh, during that time of worship, on occasion, she would let Henry put the offering in the offering plate. It was a regular routine. It was fine. It was a fun thing for him to get to do and share share in worship with. The thing was, though, when, when Henry got old enough, and his piggy bank, his first piggy bank, got full, he opened it up, and he poured out all the coins, and there were some, some dollar bills, and I think there was like one $5 bill in there. We had a, a neighbor that would spoil our children and give them, she was called Grandma Kathy, to the, by the whole neighborhood. Um, he emptied out his whole piggy bank, and he, put, he made three piles after he had counted it. He, he set one aside to buy a toy that he wanted to buy. Another one was set aside to put back in the piggy bank because he didn't want to empty the whole thing out. You know, it's easier to get it full again if it's already got some started in it, right? The third pile, though, he looked at Krista, and he looked at me, and he said, I want to take that to church. As a parent, you go, I don't know where this is going to go. Or are you just going to walk around with it all morning? We'll just see what happens. He took it to church. And we're in the midst of worship. Now, Bologna had a, has a metal building. So it's concrete floor, metal walls. It is delightfully echoey. That's important. Especially for parents who get nervous when kids make noise in worship. This is a good story for you. We're going about worship. Krista and the boys are sitting in the back, doing their thing. The boys are sitting with Brad and Debbie Johnson because sometimes they wanted to sit with the other adults at church. And it comes time. It comes time for the offering, and I do my usual pastoral routine. We get the the baskets, and the ushers come forward, and and we pray over them, and and then the the ushers start going about their work, and I do my routine of turning around and not paying attention to what anybody in the congregation is doing, because believe it or not, pastors don't want to pay attention to that. It's awkward, I promise, um, and uncomfortable. But as the ushers are going about their business, the church pianist is playing away. Beautiful music is filling the room. We're happy. Everything's great. And then we hear it. See, here we use baskets. 
At Bologna, they had metal plates. <laughs> Henry opened his bag and began dumping in the coins. You could not hear the piano. <laughs> Because, of course, they had to cascade from a certain height. And then when he realized the sound they were making, he slowed down the rate at which they were being poured out of the bag. So for a good 20 seconds, we got to hear clink, 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 clink. The laughter that filled that room in that moment, because everybody immediately turned around. It was impossible not to hear that sound. And all we could do was laugh just out of sheer joy for that holy disruption in the midst of our, our calm, everyday, regular weekend worship, because it, sometimes worship feels like it's going through the motions, right? But that moment caught us all off guard and drew our attention to the wonderful act of generosity that was unfolding. Because Henry knew the stuff that happened at the church, that we fed people, we took care of people, we, we, we reached out to local neighborhoods, and we wanted to be a place where people were reminded that they are loved and, and cared for. He, he knew that that, that that gift would go towards that. More to the point, he had, he had learned that. And rest assured, I'm not bragging on Krista or I because it was unintentional. We did not intend to, to offer that, that bit of instruction and, and see that. But that experience and that leaning into generosity that he had seen week in and week out clearly had shaped him. That's why these stories matter. That's why our example matters. It's why this, this call in the book of Deuteronomy is not just to, to simply hold on to the words in this book and to, to not walk away for, from them. It's, it's to recite them to our children. It's to make use of them. It's to live out what, what these stories teach us, these beautiful moments of Jesus caring for people, reaching out, making a difference in the world, not just in the, the state of people's souls and hearts and lives, but but in the fullness of their days. That's why it's significant for us to share in that work of loving into the future. See, when we invest in this communal work of, of sharing the, the love of, of God, the, the importance of loving our neighbor, we do so in part because of the witness of love and grace that it offers to the future. It offers those foundational stories that keep us grounded in the messy seasons of life. Stories that, that sometimes catch us off guard when we remember them or when we encounter them again after a long time of not looking at them. But stories that can, that can help us through the seasons where we feel as though we're walking through that valley of the shadow of death. That's so much the gift that we can offer. The reminder for people that even when it feels as though the world is as dark and as cruel as it can be, even though the world would echo over our children, echo over us, a million different labels and names and judgments upon how good or bad or indifferent we may be, the reality is that offering those foundational stories grants a reminder that you I, that all those we encounter are beloved, regardless of how messy life may get. That God loves you. As they say in our children's ministry, God loves you and you are a blessing. Even when there are days where you don't feel like a blessing. Because we all know those happen. As you go through uh, this next week, I, I encourage you to, to pray for uh, these four young men that, that are receiving these Bibles. To lift them up, that they would encounter those stories of love and hope and healing. That they would delve into them. But I also would challenge you with, with this little piece. Remember that so much of the point of stewardship is not... I, the, the financial piece is important. I don't want to shy away from that. That is what it is. We, we know that that has to happen for, 
for ministry to work, for the church to operate. It just does. And it makes a lot of great things possible, like we've talked about the last two weeks. If you haven't caught up on that, the last two weeks are literally just cheering sessions for everything that, that y'all, that, that our church is, is in, and has been doing and is dreaming of in the future. But as you go through your, your days this week, ponder what it is that you're sharing for the future. The stories, the faith, prayers, hope, even, even if you feel as though your well is empty. Because even in seasons where we feel empty, there's, there's the potential for the Holy Spirit to surprise us. That's your challenge. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift of your Spirit, for your abiding love in the messiness of life. We thank you for the stories that shape us and ground us, for the ways that we share in, in working towards your peaceable kingdom in the future. Grant that we would be given a vision of hope. Grant that we would be given a encouragement and that your spirit would embolden us to share your love into the future. Grant that we, would be grounded in the story that reminds us that you love us deeply. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.